Welcome to Poetry Parlay, organized by Sandra Clevin and Caitlin Buxbaum. All right, so let me introduce to you all our poet, Ray Ball. Ray is an associate professor of history at the University of Alaska Anchorage. She is the author of four books, including two poetry chapbooks, Tithe of Salt from Louisiana Literature and Lararium, which just came out from Variant Lit. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals, including Cirque, Glass, The Tulane Review, and Waccamaw. Ray is a Fulbright Scholar, an award-winning teacher, and a recipient of multiple nominations for Pushcart and Best of the Net. She is a poetry editor at Coffin Bell and on the board of directors of the journal Alaska Women Speak. And we will come back to Yvonne Boland when it is time to share her poems. So, Ray, take it away. Yay, thank you, Caitlin, for that introduction. I'll start with um, a couple of poems from my first chapbook, Ties of Salt, which uh, really focuses a lot on um, history and my identity as a historian and history professor. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to Evan Bolin's poetry is because um, she has such a rich understanding of, of history and in particular people who are often marginalized from at least um, sort of the, the secondary school types of narratives that you tend to get about history, in particular uh, women and, um, you know, people who might be written about less, um, like um, the enslaved and, and people like that. Um, so I'm going to read two poems um, from this book, and uh, they both sort of focus on my work uh, related to Spain and its empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and the first one is called During the Time of Omens. The voice of Sihuacoat came at night, a comet in lamentation, an echo in the bone. The voice of the weeping woman came from the mirror, the bird's diadem showed, the strange ones on the shores. The earth quaked, the hanging ropes fell from the sky. Motekazuma sent the sorcerers, shields of spellbound blood to destroy the Castilians. The harmful winds blew in the wrong direction. Motekazuma imprisoned the wizards. The guards opened the doors to empty rooms. The magicians flew to the ends of the earth. Their houses vanished. Foundations rooted out. Only the air still echoed with smallpox. The voice of the other woman weeping came from the lake. The Castilian brigantines sailed across. The next, oh, thank you. Um, the next poem that I'm, I'm going to read, um, it has its, its origins in a, um, a run. I, um, I'm injured right now, but typically I, I tend to run a lot. Uh, and I was on a run with my friend Veronica, and she was telling me about her family's foreign exchange student who was from Spain, and uh, obviously this was before the pandemic, and uh, she uh, didn't know anything about Spanish colonialism, and they had taken her to, I think, um, like St. Augustine in, in, in Florida and places, and she just had no idea I mean, that really resonated with my experience of going to public history sites in Spain, where a lot of that um, colonial history is really glossed over and Spain is portrayed as sort of this civilizing force versus um, a, a force that undertook a lot more problematic kinds of, of actions against uh, people, um, indigenous peoples and, uh, and persons uh, from Africa held in slavery. Um, so I, I wrote this poem 
Um, it's called Opopira Magna. Um, and uh, just one little thing to make it maybe a little bit more accessible is um, Opopira was a, a sort of um, a elixir ungent that medieval physicians used. Uh, and they um, used a, a bunch of herbs and either sugar or honey to try to cure all kinds of things like hemorrhages and paralysis. Um, but the, the medicine itself doesn't really do a lot of good. So you can sort of get a sense um, as what the title's relationship to the poem um, is. Opopira Magna. While my friend and I are running in the snow one morning, she tells me that her family's foreign exchange student knows nothing about the Spanish conquests of the Americas. I could sculpt her a polychrome work of art, like one in a Castilian museum that was once a convent. Saints Cosmas and Damien, so learned in leechcraft, perform a surgery. They transplant a leg to save a man with cankerous flesh. In the hagiographies, the Syrian twins take the replacement limb from a fresh corpse. The accepted physician's wisdom being that the dead feel no pain. But in this textured version, shining with glistening gold, they steal the lower leg of a black man who groans and clutches at his knee while the patient reclines on a fine bed full of pillows. I have often thought of this sculpture and could inform her of this parable of colonialism, buoyed by the church, built on top of stolen bodies of color, broken at the pleasure of men who will one day be constructed white. Thank you. And as you can see, my tiny ears are like pressing my earbuds out. So <laughs> please, please forgive me. Um, to, to maybe switch gears um, after something a little grim and, and gruesome, um, I'll, I'll read a new poem now. Uh, and uh, is, uh, is Mahogany here? She's not here. Um, too bad. Okay, so if you haven't seen Wonder Woman 1984, and you plan to see it and you don't want any spoilers, you might wanna turn your volume off um, until I'm done with this poem. I'll give you a, a heart reaction when I'm done in case you want to um, you know, not have anything potentially spoiled for you um, from this poem. It has a bleeding title in which the title feeds into the poem. Um, so I'll just start with, with it and move right in. After I watch Wonder Woman 1984, I catch my dog eating moose poop in the backyard. So I Google copophragia and learn that female dogs are more likely to engage in this behavior than males. It's as if women are more accustomed to having to eat shit it's like how in Wonder Woman 1984, Diana Prince spends 70 years pining for a man, how she and Barbara Minerva can't be friends and competent women at the same time because the world and the plot can't handle two powerful women at once without implosion how she has to renounce her only wish to save the world from a con man. I take comfort in reading online that this time of year, moose nuggets are really just balls of sawdust, recycled forage passing through four stomachs and now a fifth. I take comfort they're not as likely to carry parasites as deer shit. My search also reveals a news story from several years ago 
when school staff tricked Manitoba teens into eating moose poop. One girl was humiliated, feces stuck in her braces, as if middle school years weren't shitty enough. It's as if adults are assholes who don't need Maxwell Lord to grant their wishes in order to become apex predators. I feel like that was good timing with your dog. <laughs> right. <laughs> now she's just going to continue uh, in her insanity. So um, yeah, uh, people are, are, many people are good, but a lot of people are just really, really freaking terrible. Um, so uh, the, the next poem that I'm going to read is, is from my new topic, um, Lorarium, uh, which mostly focuses on my relationship with my uh, late father, who was a, a herpetologist, a person who studies reptiles and amphibians. So I grew up in a house with hundreds of snakes and lizards and frogs and tortoises, but also some other animals as, as well. Um, and so a lot of the poems focus on my relationship with my father, but also uh, my relationship with, with animals and sort of ecology is an offshoot of that relationship. Um, and, and this poem um, also shows something of my sort of intellectual heritage perhaps as well. Um, I dedicated it to the um, advisor of my master's thesis, John Brooke, um, who uh, first introduced me to the concept of, of learned pigs um, when I was working on popular entertainment in uh, the early American Republic in the 1790s. I mean, I also dedicate it to um, my wonderful poetry mentor, um, Ishmael Angeluk Hope, uh, who um, is just an incredible uh, writer and storyteller and scholar. Um, and um, I'm so indebted uh, to, to both of them. Uh, this poem is called Learned Pig Writes a Poem. The traveling circus makes its way through the woods where fallen leaves muffle footsteps and the rattling of wheels and black flies swarm swine and horse and man alike. The learned pig grunts <laughs> twice and slips away into forested freedom. He roams alone as much as his dad had. His mama had once eaten a newspaper while she was pregnant. Now there are no Italian fireworks to light his way, no acrobats to leap, no more audiences to astonish and amaze. The sound of applause rings in his ears, then fades away. He snuffles acorns and truffles. He feasts in forested freedom for an untold number of days. But after a while, he hungers for more. He noses some twigs into formation. I could have been an ABCD Aryan, fledgling and elemental. In another life, I might have been Francis or Roger Bacon. Thanks. That one's for Linda Lucky to you because she likes humor and her poetry and her jokes. Um, the next one I'll go with uh, is uh, a, a poem that I think uh, really encapsulates a, a lot of the, the sort of uh, tone of the chat book and my relationship with my father. Uh, this poem is, is called Inheritance uh, and it's, it's after a really beautiful Bruce Snyder poem uh, called Afterlife. Night drapes itself over East Texas pines. Enough moon to cast shadows of snake-like twigs. 
The toads croak, signaling their desire to mate. After all of these years, I am still able to discern smooth movements of serpents ahead on the narrow country road. This is my inheritance from my father, whose hands built bed frames and hutches, some for animals. He crafted traps. Deep in my closet, I store his old camera. I tell myself, one day I will learn to handle it. <coughs> Winding the film so that it catches the moving creatures I cannot leave to the moonlit earth. Another newer um, one, um, this one came out in, in December uh, with uh, Orange Blossom Review, which is the, the journal of the Flor Florida English Teachers uh, Association. Um, and it's part of a, a topic manuscript that I'm working on that plays with uh, the genre of, of field guides and, and classifications. Um, and it's called Field Guide to Distinguishing Red Objects. Field Guide to Distinguishing Red Objects. One, I prepare to teach my students about cochineal, about the red beetle, Dactylopius caucus, that lives in symbiosis with the prickly pear. The Spanish closely guarded its trade in the 16th and 17th centuries and kept the truth about the source of their carmine dye a secret. Scientists debated and peered through their microscopes, attempting to confirm berry or beetle or grain of cactus. Flecks of rust float up from the bottom of my old red tea kettle. If I Google corrosion, I will read that the cost of water could triple in the next decade. Two, red clay of my birthplace. In the story, the stag's heart beats red, bleeds red, shrieks of mice in the jaws of scarlet king snakes, red corn snakes, northern red bellies, coral snakes carried blood to my ears, red after yellow, Deadly fellow, my mother hummed, red after black, good friend Jack. I learned this lesson as a child. If only stop signs existed for people. Three, I lived six years in a town without a single stoplight. My mind reddens with memory. I lived in Madrid. The red line took me from my apartment to the archives and back again. I slung my red leather briefcase on my shoulder, crimson and cream, scarlet and gray. My father was red green, colorblind. Four, red jasper, red hickory, red larch. Five, hands chap. Red bud blooms on my knuckles from washing again and again and again. I allow my niece to paint my toenails candy apple. The retired rover on the red planet examines its robotic limb and takes another selfie for Instagram. A stone of red plum sits in the pit of my stomach. Six, red dress will be left on the back of the chair, strapless bra slipping to the floor. I will tease my husband, lovingly call him red beard, muted mouths red in morning's soft light. A sip of wine. 
Thank you. Uh, oh, Mahogany, you came too late. I read the Wonder Woman poem for you. I'm sorry. I'm my Where were you? I've been at my friend's house. I'm not normally set up like I normally do when it's time to do it. You do it again. Know, uh, read it maybe again. I'll read it again if there's time. Yes, and so, so, so the next poem that I, I'm going to read is uh, a, a golden shovel. Um, if you don't know the, the form of a golden shovel, it's a, a, a poetry form created by Terence Haynes to honor um, the magnificent Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and so often poets use um, lines or words from Gwendolyn Brooks poems, although not always. Um, and usually it's the last word or phrase in each line um, that belongs to the, the original poet. Um, and so um, it's, it's kind of seen as a, a sento type of form in which you're in conversation with um, the original poem. Um, and so um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll read the last word in each line um, so you can sort of get the sense of, uh, <laughs> of um, the, the language and that I'm um, reacting to in this yeah. Gwendolyn yeah. Brooks poem. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, all right, Caitlin, thank you. Um, and so um, this, this uh, Gwendolyn Brooks poem is called When You Have Forgotten Sunday, um, The Love Story. And if you haven't read it, um, you should, because it's such a beautiful poem. But um, sort of the premise is um, this husband is off at war and it's a little ambiguous as to whether or not the woman will ever see him um, again. And so um, it, it closes um, with, with these words. When you have, I say, forgotten all that, then you may tell, then I may believe you have forgotten me well. Um, and so um, this poem is, is a golden shovel after Gwendolyn Brooks. It's called, Then I May Believe. The day you escaped, little bird, when you fled your jailer, knowing you would never see me again, you must have flapped your wings. Central vein hit wind. I had forgotten you were not my heart's way to say, flutter, beat, persist. I had forgotten so many things. How to poach an egg and all the useful ways of carving knives that my mother taught me. I would tell you then if you wanted to return that you could leave me a sign three silver coins may is the month of commemoration i would tell you to bring me a silk thread then we could begin again slow binding i would tell you that for all that may come amidst salt and bread and bone to believe, I have never wished you ill, but you were wise and have never looked back. I have held the egg to my parted lips, forgotten what my intentions were. Forgive me, it is impossible to make a war poem end well. Switch away from the other Thank you. So to, to lighten it up a little bit after the, after that one, here's a super short one. Um, it's called urinal. <laughs> urinal. How many times before there were latrines did the saints in the corner enact the small miracle of prevention? The needs of the groin are dark and golden. Um, so, so the, the, the next poem I, I'm going to read is, is also relatively new. I, I wrote it this summer and, uh, um, I, I wrote it sort of, um, in response to constantly freaking out about whether or not I, or, or my husband had COVID, like any headache that we were getting from like constant zooms. I was like, oh, it's COVID. 
Um, and then also um, the, the Black Lives Matter protests um, in response to uh, George Floyd's murder in, in particular. Um, and, um, you know, things are, are weighing heavily on me um, today in the aftermath of, of last night's shooting. And um, really, you know, the fact that, that white nationalism is, is so baked into much of, of this country's DNA. And so we, we can't say hate is a virus because that, um, that really, you know, takes the agency away from, from people making a choice um, to engage in, in anti-racism. Um, and so um, this, this poem was published at, at Juke Joint, which is a, a, a lit mag I totally dig. They're, they're Southern and I'm super stoked um, that I can share the news that I'm joining their masthead um, as an assistant editor. Um, so uh, this poem's called Small Joys Amidst the Turbulence of Pandemic and Social Unrest. And it's after Susan Mitchell's Blackbirds. Because it is mid-morning, I take my dog for a walk. And because my dog is a stubborn ass, I must stand at the edge of a neighbor's lawn, rattling a tin of treats and white privilege. The sun is already warm. I fold light right up into my pocket, which knows how to hold on to things, keeping them snug sometimes through several washings. Light rests against my thigh as I read the will of an Afro-Peruvian woman named Juana Barba, who lived 400 years ago. She gave money to have a cloak made for a statue of the Virgin Mary. All afternoon, my hands braid together tiny strands to weave joy from a multitude of things. Recently, my husband had a cold and not COVID-19. Cilantro tastes light and bright and not like Lysol to me. Storks are nesting high on poles across Andalusia. A coon hound sleeps under my feet. Caramel exists and I bake it into salty cookies. My nieces are holding a cartwheel contest. From now on, I want to end each day by examining the contents of my right hand pocket. The light cannot belong to any one person. I open my fingers to admire it and let it escape. It swoops across the fireweed and into the throats of chanting protesters. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, all right, so I think um, next, um, how am I doing on time? Am I still good, Caitlin? Do I have a little bit more I mean, more time? we play it pretty loosey-goosey here, so. Okay, I'm gonna you. read the, the poem that has uh, the longest title of anything that I've published, but it has super short lines. Um, and uh, it's in Tithe of Salt, but uh, it was first published by Moria and, and nominated for, for Pushcart. Uh, it's called After Reading Discourses about how a bird can be prepared for a banquet so that its feathers remain intact by exsanguinating it through the mouth and careful use of damp claws. Plate the peacock with gold leaf. In its mouth, a flame of camphor. Serve the bird first, standing upright in irons with tail feathers spread. The meat of this bird increases melancholy and is only moderately nourishing. When roasted, old ones can be kept eight days in winter. Uh, and I, I was gonna end with um, a, a 
another poem from from Lorarium, but um, since people are asking for an encore <laughs> um, <laughs> of, of the Wonder Woman poem, uh, I'll, I'll 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 do that. And 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 once again, if you wanted to avoid spoilers, um, you know, I guess you can. Um, turn off your volume until you see Caitlin come back with like the PowerPoint to introduce even Yvonne, Eve, Eve Ann Boland, my goodness. Um, this is the woman who says, uh, you know, the vampires of the bonities instead of the vampires of the bonfires of the vanities. <laughs> All right, so after I watch Wonder Woman 1984, I catch my dog eating moose poop in the backyard. So I Google copophragia and learn that female dogs are more likely to engage in this behavior than males. It's as if women are more accustomed to having to eat shit. It's like how in Wonder Woman 1984, Diana Prince spends 70 years pining for a man how she and Barbara Minerva can't be friends and competent women at the same time because the world and the plot can't handle two powerful women at once without implosion. How she has to renounce her only wish to save the world from a con man. I take comfort in reading online that this time of year, moose nuggets are really just balls of sawdust, recycled forage passing through four stomachs and now a fifth. I take comfort, they're not as likely to carry parasites as deer shit. My search also reveals a new story from several years ago when school staff tricked Manitoba teens into eating moose poop, one girl was humiliated, feces stuck in her braces, as if middle school years weren't shitty enough. It's as if adults are assholes who don't need Maxwell Lord to grant their wishes in order to become apex predators. Thank you. And now to the main. Oh, right, oh, right, oh, right, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I picked that just for you, Mo. I uh, appreciate it. I appreciate it. I was like, God, I have a Wonder Woman poem I was going to share with you. I'll send it to you later, though. But it's the happy birthday. Uh, well, Mahogany, you could read it uh, at Friends. Yeah, read it uh, at Friends. So, okay. So let us return to the program. It's funny, Ray, you're talking about how to say her name. I have now heard it about four different ways. Yvonne, Ivan, even... So I, I listened. I listened to several interviews with her because a, an Irish friend told me it was Yvonne, um, mm -hmm. and then a, a friend told me that her Irish friend said it's Eve Ann. So I listened to interviews, and and uh, Eve Ann seems to be the the way that she pronounced it. And I see. All right. Speak, yeah, I, I've yeah. have heard her speak, and it is Eve Ann. Well, roll with that then. Yes, yeah. the Sanders oh. have all the knowledge. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, Ivan Boland was an Irish poet, for those of you who didn't figure that out already, <laughs> born to a diplomat and an expressionist painter. She, in uh, 1944, she received her bachelor's from Trinity College in 66 and was also educated in London and New York. She published five poetry collections and two collections of prose, one of which won the 2012 Penn Award. And she also translated and introduced a book called After Every War, which was an anthology of German women poets. She received numerous awards for her work and was a professor of English at Stanford University, where she directed the creative writing program until she died last year. Quite the poet. Great choice, Ray. And I have the text of the poems you said you wanted to read. Do you want me to show those on the screen? 
Absolutely. While you read them? Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. I just wanted to see which one you were going to. Oh, and do you want to say a little bit about why you chose her as your poet of influence? Sure. I mean, I, I, I intimated a little bit at, at the beginning that one of the reasons that I, I chose her is um, because she's a poet who's very interested in, in history and in telling the stories of people who don't often make it into what she calls the official histories. I'm a historian. I think, oh, well, there are people doing women and gender history and all kinds of, of subaltern history. So I don't necessarily agree with, with that stance, but I really admire um, that effort to um, engage with the past um, and to um, really focus on women and women's lives and everyday experiences um, and the way that she interweaves that with with myth and legend I just find so incredibly powerful and um, her imagery is is absolutely stunning um, I've I've heard her speak in in interviews where she talks about how maybe it has to do with the fact that her mother was um, a painter uh, and so I just uh, you know for me she's someone who represents um, everything that I would love to be as a, a poet um, and, a, and a, a teacher. Um, so that's largely why I, I picked her. Um, I also was uh, thinking about picking Natasha Trethaway, uh, who's another poet who deals a lot with, with history and her poetry. Um, but I was like, it's St. Patrick's Day. I should pick an Irish poet. And so I, I picked Ivan Boland. And I'll read Song and Error. The old Latin master is dying among almonds, mosquitoes, and the drizzle of the Black Sea. The emperor has banished him from Rome. Ovid, I loved you when I was a girl. I hated my fair skin and freckles, my irregular eyes with yellow in the middle. You were my laureate of escape. You filled the peacock's tail with human eyes. You showed me how to flee from entity to being. You could transform women into water. You made the funeral smoke from the mercenary's grave spiral up to become a flight of birds. You write like you were banished for Carmen et Error. A literal translation might be poem and mistake. Better to render it as song and error. Now there is no escape. 17 species of almond trees are flowering everywhere, reminds you this is not Rome. When evening comes, a boy who cannot speak Latin reaches to light the lamp. He holds a candle made from the pith of rushes. He touches the wick. The room brightens quickly. He has no language for the empire that owns him. And of shadow, of simile. One afternoon of summer rain, my hand skimmed a shelf and I found an old florin, Ireland, 1950. We say like or as, and the world is a fish minted in silver and alloy, an outing for all the children, an evening in the Sanford cinema, a paper cone of lemonade crystals and say it again so we can see androgyny of angels, edges to a circle, the way the body works against the possible and no one to tell us now or ever why it ends, why it has to end. I am holding two whole shillings of nothing, observing its heaviness, its uselessness, and how in the cool shadow of nowhere, a salmon leaps up to find a weir. 
it could not even know was never there. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Well, we are now on to the community reading. We have 15 readers signed up today. And I made this one a PDF this time because her poems are a little bit longer than the ones we had last time where I had the PowerPoint set up. Here is your list of readers uh, in order of appearance. <laughs> so Brenda will be our first reader, followed by Heidi and then Amy. So Brenda is going to read Quarantine. I selected Quarantine and this poem about the Irish famine of the mid-19th century talks about a couple who leave the workhouse during the worst year of the Irish famine. And the woman was sick with uh, typhus fever. I just read this poem and I just said, this is all about love and quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season, of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north. And all under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history, but her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory their death together in the winter of 1847. Also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and a woman. And in the darkness, it could best be proved. Thank you. Next we have Heidi reading this moment. This is a really nice kind of shorter one. This moment. A neighborhood at dusk, things are getting ready to happen out of sight. Stars and moths and rinds slanting around fruit, but not yet. One tree is black, one window is yellow as butter. A woman leans down to catch a child who has run into her arms this moment. Stars rise, moths flutter, apples sweeten in the dark. Thank you, Heidi. And what was the name of that book that you had that from? This is from In a Time of Violence. Okay. Which awesome. I picked up at Tile Wave. Shout out to used books. All right. <laughs> yeah, mine was from that too, I think. Oh, nice. All right, Amy, you're up. Great. I wish I could do an Irish accent because that's how I hear this poem, but I won't. <laughs> make you suffer through that. <laughs> so just imagine it in your head. <laughs> the wounds are terrible. The paint is old. The cracks along the lips and on the cheeks cannot be fixed. The cotton lawn is soiled. The arms are ivory dissolved to wax. Recall the quadrille. Hum the waltz. Promenade on the yacht club terraces. Put back the lamps in their copper holders, the carriage wheels on the cobbles quays. And recreate Easter in Dublin booted officers, their mistresses, sunlight crisscrossing college green, steam hissing from the flanks of horses. Here they are, cradled and clean, held close in the arms of their owners, their cold hands clasped by warm hands, their faces memorized like perfect manners. The altars are manual with linen, the lilies are whiter than slippers. Candles are burning and warning. Like Rejoice, they whisper, after sacrifice. Those chestnuts hold up their candles. The green is vivid with parasols. 
Sunlight is pastel and windless. The bar of Shelburne is full. Laughter and gossip on the terraces, rumor and alarm at the barracks. The empire is summoning its officers. The carriages are turning, they're turning back. Past children walking with governesses, looking down, cosseting their dolls, then looking up as the carriage passes, the shadow chilling them. Twilight falls. It is twilight in the Dolls Museum. Shadows remain on the parchment colored waists. Our bruises on the stitched cotton clothes are hidden in the dimples on the writs. The eyes are wide. They cannot address the helplessness which has lingered in the airless piece of each glass case to have survived, to have been stronger than a moment, to be the hostages ignorance takes from time and ornament from destiny, both, to be the present of the past, to infer the difference with a terrible stare, but not feel it and not know it. Thank you, Amy. I love that line to have been stronger than a moment. I think there was another one in there too, but anyway, great poem. And Tonya is next with a couple of oh, Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Can you hear me? Good, okay. So this first poem that I chose is an example of ekphrastic poetry. In other words, poetry that focuses on and is inspired by another work of art. And in this case, a painting. And Ray mentioned that uh, Ivan's mother was a painter. And I did wonder as I read this poem, whether it might have been a painting by her mother. Um, it's called Irish Interior. The woman sits and spins. She makes no sound. The man behind her stands by the door. There is always this, a background, a foreground. This much we know, they do not want to be here. The year is 1890. The inks have long since dried. The name of the drawing is an Irish interior. The year is 1890. Before the inks are dry, Parnell will fall and orchards burn where the two captains, Moonlight, Boycott, have had their way. She has a spinning wheel, he has a loom. She has a shawl, he stands by a landscape, maybe a river, maybe hills, maybe even a farm, opening into a distance of water song and a wood they cannot reach. Nothing belongs to them, but this melody and tyranny and hopelessness of thread rendered by line work and the skewed perspective the eye attains between his hand and the way her hand rests on the wheel which goes to prove only this, that there is always near and far as she works in one. He weaves inside the other, which we are in has yet to be made clear as we stare through the lines until their lives have almost disappeared and all we see, all we want to see, are places in the picture light forgives, such as the grain of the wood, the close seal of the thread at the top of the loom, and a door opening into an afternoon they can never avail of. And the next one is called Domestic Violence. Um, I had to read this several times before I could even begin to guess what this poem was really about. Um, I'm gonna take a stab at it that what she's trying to do is draw a parallel between domestic violence or family violence, the violence that people perpetrate on each other and political violence, um, the violence of tribe against tribe or nation against nation, both of which um, this poem is, um, is very vividly filled with. Domestic violence. It was winter, lunar, wet. At dusk, pewter seedlings became moonlight or orphans. Pleased to meet you, neat to please you, said the butcher's sign in the window in the village. Everything changed the year we got married. And after that, we moved out to the suburbs. How young we were, how ignorant, how ready to think. The only history was our own. And there was a couple who quarreled into the night. 
their voices high, sharp. Nothing is ever entirely right in the lives of those who love each other. In that season, suddenly our island broke out its old sores for all to see. We saw them too. We stood there wondering how the salt horizons and the Dublin hills, the rivers, table mountains, Viking marshes we thought we knew had been made to shiver into our ancient 12 by 15 television, which gave them back as gray and grayer tears, the killings, 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 the moonlight colored funerals. Nothing we said, not then, not later, fathomed what it is, is wrong in the lives of those who hate each other. And if the only provenance of memory is only that, remember, not atone. And if I can be safe in the weak spring light in that kitchen, then why is there another kitchen? Spring light always darkening in it, and a woman whispering to a man over and over, what else could we have done? We failed our moment, or the moment failed us. The times were grand in size and we were small. Why do I write that when I don't believe it? We lived our lives, were happy, stayed as one. Children were born and raised here and are gone, including ours. As for that couple, did we ever find out who they were? Did we want to? I think we know. I think we always knew. Okay, next, the room in which my first child slept. This one is a very puzzling poem to me. It has a lot of nuance, a lot of reverberation. Um, it's a very personal poem. I can't say I really understand it, but something about this poem really attracted me. Um, the depth of the feeling maybe, um, and some of the mystery. Okay, the room in which my first child slept. After a while, I thought of it this way. It was a town underneath a mountain, crowned by snow. And every year, a river rushed through, enveloping the dusk in a noise everyone knew singled, signaled spring. A small town, known for a kind of calico, made there, strong and unglazed, a makeshift of cotton in which the actual unseparated husks still remained and could be found if you looked behind the coarse daisies and the red-billed bird with swept back wings, always trying to arrive safely on the inch or so of cotton it might have occupied if anyone had offered it. And if you ask me now what happened to it, the town that is, the answer is, of course, there was no town. It never actually existed. And the calico, the glazed cotton on which a bird never landed, is not gone because it never was, never once. But then, how to explain that sometimes I can hear the river in those first few days of April, making its way through the dusk, having learned to speak the way I once spoke, saying, as if I didn't love you, as if I wouldn't have died for you. Great reading, Tonya, thank you. Next we have Sandra Wassily. I hope I spelled your name right. I got lost in the double letters. <laughs> oh, you did, <laughs> thank you. Um, I got to read two from um, the book Against Love Poetry and it has a painting on it. <laughs> and it's the uh, Rembrandt's The Jewish Bride. This first poem, How We Transfigured, I think follows from the last poem in an interesting way. Um, in those days, I never thought about what stayed further out from the four walls of our house, from the hills above it, from the sleeping children within it, of what lay in wait on the Irish sea as night moved away from it of what came to us as we lay there, 
held in shadows and shadows ourselves. And what will not come to us again? Light, the builder, light, the maker, fitter of roofs to gutters, of the tree's root to the tree's height, and of earth to sky from the same horizon, every time, a similar of openings at the river's mouth and the mind's eye. Thanks for that, Sandra. Sorry, guys, I didn't have the right version. Um, this one was one that was hard to find, so I don't know what happened there, because like mm. half the words were right, but <laughs> some of them were, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, but this one should be good, Irish poetry. Yes, and this is the concluding poem of this book. Irish poetry for Michael Hartnett. We always knew there was no Orpheus in Ireland, no music stored at the doors of hell, no gods to make it, no wild beast to weep and lie down to it. But I remember an evening when the sky was underworld dark at four, when ice had seized every part of the city and we sat talking the air making a wreath for our cups of tea. And you began to speak of our own gods, our heartbroken pantheon. No attic light for them and no Herodotus, but thin rain and dogfish and the stopgap of the sharp cliffs they spent their winters on and the pitch black Atlantic night. How the sound of a bird's wing in a lost language sounded. You made the noise for me, made it again until I could see the flight of it. Suddenly, the silvery lithe rivers of the Southwest lay down in silence and the savage acres no one could predict were all at ease, soothed and quiet and listening to you as I was, as if to music, as if to peace. Ah. Thank you. I love that ending. That last line is great. Yeah. Yeah. Not that the other lines aren't also great, but <laughs> that one's especially great. Yeah. All right, Sandy Yanoni is up next. I think I said that right. It can go many ways. It's all good. <laughs> okay, what do you prefer? <laughs> well, if in Italy, that would be it, but it's Yanone in, in America, which is a great way to get into this poem that I'm reading about, about things being in two countries and two languages. So here we go. Hey. This is um, Ivan Bolin's poem, A Habitable Grief from her book, The Lost Land. And um, I'll just say this briefly about this poem. Um, she died on April 29th, excuse me, April 27th of last year. And um, my first book of poetry is published with Salmon Poetry it's out of Ireland. And so um, I, I, I've known how important Evan Boland is to the country of Ireland and how she, she really was a trailblazer in opening up poetry, particularly for women to have a voice in poetry. And this was a poem that I went and recorded myself reading and um, shared with the poets on Cultivating Voice um, that day that she passed. So this is a habitable grief. Long ago, I was a child in a strange country. I was Irish in England. I learned a second language there, which has stood me in good steed, the lingua franca of a lost land, a dialect in which what had never been could still be found that infinite 
horizon, always far and impossible. That contrary passion to be whole. This is what language is. A habitable grief, a turn of speech for the everyday and ordinary abrasion of losses such as this, which hurts just enough to be a scar and heals just enough to be a nation. Um, yeah, I got a little chill there <laughs> remembering. Um, yeah, I have a little connection with with um, Ivan in that I was so fortunate that she, um, she was, in addition to being a professor at Stanford, she was also um, through December, 2019, the editor of Poetry Ireland Review, which is the preeminent journal in Ireland. You know, it's the gold standard and it would be like, being published in the New Yorker here or something. And I had written a poem about one of my mentors, Lucy Brock Broido. And I had this really uncanny feeling that she'd like it, which you never have. And um, I sent it to her and she published it. Well, you know, I got the email from her and, um, and so I was published in the, the last journal that she edited, which is a really, really amazing thing. Um, and I'll never forget that, of course. Well, this book is, um, this this poem and the next poem are from her book that was just published this fall, posthumously called The Historians. And this is the first poem in the book about her mother. I've heard her talk about this poem, um, whom, whom Ray has talked about, she was a painter. This is the fire gilder. She loved silver. She loved gold. My mother. She spoke about the influence of metals, the congruence of atoms, the art classes where she learned these things. Think of it, she would say, as she told me, to gild any surface, a master craftsman had to melt gold with mercury, had to heat both so one was volatile, one was not, and to do it right, had to separate them and then burn, burn, burn mercury until it fled and left behind a skin of light. The only thing, she added, but what came after that, I forgot. What she spent a lifetime forgetting could be my subject, the fenced in small towns of Leinster, the, the coastal villages where the language of the sea was handed on, phrases bruised by storms, by shipwrecks, but isn't. My subject is the part wishing plays in the way villages are made to vanish, in the way I learned to separate memory from knowledge, so one was volatile, one was not, and how I started writing, burning light, building heat until all at once I was the fire gilder, ready to lay radiance down, ready to decorate it happened with it never did when all at once I remember what it was, she said, the only thing is, it is extremely dangerous. And um, I'll end with the title poem from um, this, what will be her last gift to the world. Um, this is the historians. And I too, like Ray, I, I love um, Ivan's connection with history. She, if you can, if you read her a lot, um, uh, or if you enjoy her, I would really encourage you to go. She's, she, there's many readings of her on YouTube. And about once a month, I just listen to her read video after video, like all night long. 
just and I don't care if I hear the same poem again and again. Um, it's amazing to hear her um, speak about poetry and to speak about, uh, in particular, um, what she characterizes as a difference between the past and what we call history. Um, and uh, so I really uh, hope that this hearing us read the poems tonight will encourage you all to also go listen to Ivan read her own work sometime. This is The Historians. Say the word history, I see your mother, mine, the light sober, the summer well over, an east wind dandling leaves, rain stirring at the curb. Their hands are full of words. One of them holds your father's journal with its note written on the day you were born. The other, my small rhymed scratchings, my fervent letters. Before the poem ends, they will have burned them all. Now say the word again, summon our island, a story that needed to be told. The patriots still bleeding in the lithographs when we were born. Those who wrote that story labored to own it. But these are women we loved, record keepers with a different task. To stop memory becoming history, to stop words healing what should not be healed. It is cold, the light is going. They kneel now behind their greenhouses beneath whichever tree is theirs. The leaves shift down, each of them puts a match to the paper. Then they put their hands close to the flame. They feel the first bite of the wind. They lace their pages with fire. I finish writing. Thanks so much, everybody. And thanks for all the great readings. And it's wonderful to be celebrating Ivan Boland. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Sandy, for sharing all the extra stuff. I think people were really interested to hear what you had to say. Um, next, we have Linda Lucky. This is talking to my daughter late at night, and it's from her book, A Woman Without a Country. And I first, it was like right in there, like one of the first poems. And I said, oh my God, my I've had so many late night conversations over tea with my adult daughter when we moved in, at, when I first moved to Alaska, um, 18 years ago and um, she'd be up with the two kids and I'd be down and we I had this booth in my cozy space and we would meet down there and the children were asleep and had the most wonderful talks and when I read I saw this I said, this is just lovely anyway talking to my daughter late at night we have a tray a pot of tea a scone this is the hour when one thing pours itself into another, the gable of our house stored in shadow, a spring planet bending ice into an absolute of light. Your childhood ended years ago. There is no path back to it. There is no certainty I can find, the if or maybe that might remedy an afternoon you walked up the hill after school in winter, in tears. The fire smolders down into cinders. Lilac shivers in the March dark. If love is a civilization, as I once hoped it was, and you and I are its living citizens, and if our words are less than rules and more than remedies, as we speak, maybe someone escapes from a wounded morning in a small classroom and finds the world is not stern after all. Paper birds are folded and fly off in the playground. And when lessons resume in the afternoon, the essay is easy. It is a day in the life of a penny. Afterwards at tea time, the sweets have old names, cinder, toffee, bullseye, marry me quick. The children shout out and I listen to hear your voice with theirs, but no, 
It's here now telling me how late the hour is. The bird's almost up. And we smile at this and we put the tray away, douse the fire and wash out the cups. Thanks, Linda. Also, I very much like your hat. Very oh, festive. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right, next up is Eric with Becoming Anne Bradstreet. First, first I'd like to thank Caitlin for the presentation of these poems here uh, uh, to us. Uh, you know, how you formatted it? We'll say it makes us as readers almost equal to the, to the poems. The next thing I say, that Becoming Anne Bradstreet, I realize this probably should be read by a woman. And it speaks to what Sandy, yeah, say we got at least three Sandys here tonight, but uh, Sandy, you've only we talked about you know, women poets. Yeah, so, Becoming Anne Bradstreet. It happens again. As soon as I take down her book and open it, I turn the page. My skies rise higher and hang younger stars. The ship's rail freezes. Mayor Ibericum leads to Anne Bradstreet's coast. A blackbird leaves her pine trees and lands in my spruce trees. I open my door on a Dublin street. Her child, her words are staring up at me. In better dress to trim thee was my mind, but not save homespun cloth. It's house, I find. We say home truths because her words can be at home anywhere. At the source, at the end and whenever the book lies open and I am again. An Irish poet watching an English woman become an American poet. Thanks, Eric. I was actually kind of, I thought it was kind of cool that you ended up picking this poem. <laughs> and we, we do have a lot of women here tonight. Um, so I thought it was interesting that you ended up with that one. And next we have... Good transition. I didn't even do that on purpose. Anne, after becoming Anne Bradstreet, we have Anne Ward Masterson. Okay. Um, this one is called How We Made a New Art on Old Ground. And it resonated with me in trying to navigate wounds and memory of those wounds, but also deciding how we live with them and how we become more than them. So this is how we made a new art on old ground. A famous battle happened in this valley. You never understood the nature poem till now, till this moment. If these statements seem separate, unrelated, Follow this, silence to its edge, and you will hear the history of air, the crispness of a fern, or the upward cut and turn around of a field fair or thrush written on it. The other history is silent. The estuary is over there. The issue was decided here. Two kings prepared to give no quarter. Then one king and one dead tradition. Now the humid dusk, the old wounds wait for language, for a different truth. When you see the silk of the willow and the wider edge of the river turn, and grow dark and then darker, then you will know that the nature poem is not the action nor its end. It is this rust on the gate 
beside the trees, on the cattle grid underneath our feet, on the steering wheel shaft. It is an aftermath, an overlay, and even in its own modest way, an art of peace. I try the word distance and it fills with sycamores, a summer's worth of pollen. And as I write valley, straw, metal, blood, oaths, armor are unwritten. Silence spreads slowly from these words to those ilex trees half in, half out of shadows falling on the shallow ford of the south bank beside Yellow Island. As twilight shows how this sweet corrosion begins to be complete, what we see is what the poem says. Evening coming, cattle, cattle shadows, and wind bushes and a change of weather about to change them all. What we see is how the place and the torment of the place are for this moment free of one another. Another great ending. Thank you, Anne. Next we have Katie. And sorry, this is a little blurry. I did not realize that until I made the PDF. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 uh, I chose these because the little reading I did about Yvonne Boland today, I learned that she, you know, was, uh, of course, um, working with her heading up the creative writing program at Stanford when during the pandemic, she went back to Dublin uh, and was teaching remotely a, a course on 20th century Irish literature when she died suddenly of a stroke at the age of 90, of 75, just uh, going on it on a year ago. And also because it's St. Patrick's Day and my mother is Irish. So Mother Ireland, at first I was land. I lay on my back to be fields and when I turned on my side, I was a hill under freezing stars. I did not see, I was seen. Night and day, words fell on me, seeds, raindrops, chips of frost. From one of them, I learned my name. I rose up, I remembered it. Now I could tell my story. It was different from the story told about me. And now also it was spring. I could see the wound I had left in the land by leaving it. I traveled west. Once there, I looked with so much love at every field as it unfolded its rusted wheel and its pram chassis and at the gorse bright distances. I had been that they misunderstood me. Come back to us, they said. Trust me, I whispered. And the other one I chose was in which the ancient history I learn is not my own. The linen map hung from the wall. The linen was shiny and cracked in places. The cracks were darkened by grime. It was fastened to the classroom wall with a wooden batten on triangle of knotted cotton. We have no oracles, no rocks or olive trees, no sacred path to the temple and no priestesses. The teacher's voice had a London accent. This was London. This was England, 1952. It was ancient history class. Ireland was far away and farther away every year. I was nearly an English child. I could list the English kings. I could place the famous battles. I was learning to recognize God's grace in history. The colors were faded out. So the red of empire, the stain of absolute possession, the mark once made from Kashmir to the oast barns of the Kent. All right, Cynthia, go ahead. The pomegranate. I put a little info in the chat um, about Ceres and Persephone. The only legend I have ever loved 
is the story of a daughter lost in hell and found and rescued there. Love and blackmail are the gist of it. Ceres and Persephone, the names. And the best thing about the legend is I can enter it anywhere and have. As a child in exile in a city of fogs and strange consonants, I read it first. And at first, I was an exiled child in the crackling dust of the underworld. The stars blighted. Later, I walked out on a summer's twilight, searching for my daughter at bedtime. When she came running, I was ready to make any bargain to keep her. I carried her back past white beams and wasps and honey-scented budaleas. But I was serious then, and I knew winter was in store for every leaf on every tree on that road. Was inescapable for each one we passed, and for me. It is winter, and the stars are hidden. I climb the stairs and stand where I can see my child asleep beside her teen magazines, her can of Coke, her plate of uncut fruit. The pomegranate. How did I forget it? She could have come home and been safe and ended the story and all our heartbroken searching. But she reached out a hand and plucked a pomegranate. She put out her hand and pulled down the French sound for apple and the no noise of stone and the proof that even in the place of death, at the heart of legend, in the midst of rocks full of unshed tears, ready to be diamonds by the time the story was told, a child can be hungry. I could warn her, there is still a chance. The rain is cold. The road is flint colored. The suburb has cars and cable television. The veiled stars are above ground. It is another world, but what else can a mother give her daughter but such beautiful rifts in time? If I defer the grief, I will diminish the gift. The legend will be hers as well as mine. She will enter it as I have. She will wake up. She will hold the papery flushed skin in her hand and to her lips. I will say nothing. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tara, it's your turn. Okay, thank you, Ray, for, uh, of course, your wonderful poems and also for choosing Evan Boland. Um, I can't, I can't say, I can't read the poem without also thanking um, poet Linda McCarriston, who was uh, my professor at, in UAA's MFA program, and um, she's a joint citizen of Ireland and the United States, and so uh, she introduced me to um, Evan Boland's work, and so I'm forever grateful for that. Uh, this poem comes from Against Love Poetry, and it's titled The Burdens of a History, and it's in strophes, so I'll just say um, one, two, etc. when I move to the next trophy. The Burdens of a History. One, I have a reason for remembering the unseasonable heat of that evening, a skin of wet air on the apples, the plane tree leaves dry as lavender. Two, we said we would not talk about the past, about what had happened, which is history, about what could happen, which is fear. Three, then you brought a map down from the attic, folded in such a way it fell open at once in your hands and had the feel of linen partly, and paper only slightly. These were the wetlands. This was the coast. This was our country. And already the spidery red lines were widening into the roads our parents drove west on, looking for signposts they had just missed. Four. I went into a field above the city when I was just 14 years of age, before sex, before settling down, before growing up, there was this. Rust was everywhere, 
a second skin on every inch of iron. Distances were less ambitious. Car parts and wheels in the ditches seemed to say that travel was an error whose starting point would end back here in this air made out of humid blues and the cattle which had not moved once. Five. When the storm broke, they were under it, the heat cracking, rain hissing on the car. They counted from the thunder on their fingers and waited in the freshening, lifting air for the first strike of lightning, which, if it did not kill them, would show them exactly where they were. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Another great poem. Jim, you're up next. Let's find Jim. I see Brenda. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Well, here's Jim. <laughs> Great. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> bad timing. <laughs> um, the poem I have is called Atlantis, a lost sonnet. And before I started telling you, I wanted to say something about two years after I got my teaching degree and started teaching. I came back home to Spokane and all the places I had lived in had been scraped to the ground. Uh, one apartment building was a Burger King outlet. Uh, another one was scraped. A two-story building was scraped and gone right across from Dick's uh, hamburger shop. And then everything had been changed. Uh, the black walnut tree that I used to read under gone. Anyway, uh, I'm telling you this because this poem is about Atlantis, uh, a part of our civilization that just simply disappeared. It's in the shape of a sonnet, is that, that's what she says. But uh, when I went to school, uh, the sonnet was 14 lines long. It had a fixed rhyme scheme. And, when we were told to write a couple of sonnets, uh, I sort of learned that it was like a box that you just sort of filled things in. And uh, after I started teaching, I uh, realized that the sonnet had really been loosened up and modern poets really tackled it a lot differently. Uh, this poem is not 14 lines long, it's 15. And I really don't have a clue what the 15th line is. Uh, the purpose of it. Um, uh, I like the poem. It's really easy. It's conversational. There were only four words that were three syllables. Everything was simple. And uh, I liked it also because of the Ciceras. And uh, how on earth did it happen? I used to wonder that a whole city, arches, pillars, colonnades, not to mention vehicles and animals, had all one fine day gone under. I mean, I said to myself, the world was small then, surely a great city must have been missed. I miss our old city. White pepper, white pudding, you and I meeting under fan lights and low skies to go home in it. Maybe what really happened is this. The old fable makers searched hard for a word to convey that what is gone is gone forever and never found it. And so in the best traditions of where we come from, they gave their sorrow a name and drowned it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I believe we have two more readers for this portion. Steve followed by John, who will close us out. So Steve. Okay. Um, first of all, this is and soul. First of all, um, just a, a couple of words. I just wanted to um, uh, tell you what they meant. Liffey, L-I-F-F-E-Y, is a river in Ireland that flows through the center of Dublin. And that comes up. Also, the North Wall is an area on the River Liffey containing the docks and financial centers. They, they come up, it's 
they aren't explained. So I just thought I'd you know, go ahead and say that. And so my mother died one summer, the wettest in the records of the state. Crops rotted in the West, checked tablecloths dissolved in back gardens. Empty deck chairs collected rain. As I took my way to her through traffic, through lilacs dripping blackly behind houses and on curbsides to pay her the last tribute of a daughter, I thought of something I remembered. I heard once that the body is, or is said to be, almost all water. And as I turned southward, ours, that ours is a city of it, one in which every single day the elements begin a journey towards each other that will never, given our weather, fail. The ocean, excuse me, the ocean visible in the edges cut by it, cloud color reaching into air, the liffy storing one and summoning the other, salt greeting the lack of it at the north wall, and as if that wasn't enough, all of it ending up almost every evening inside our speech, coast, canal, ocean, river, stream, and now mother. And I drove on, and although the mind is unreliable in grief, at the next cloudburst, it almost seemed they could be shades of each other, the way the body is, of every one of them, and now they're on the move again, fog into mist, mist into sea spray, and both into the oily glaze that lay on the railings of the house she was dying in as I went inside. And the next one, exile, 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 uh, the, the Comoracs, I hope I'm saying that correctly, are mountains in Southeast Ireland. All night, the room breathes, breathes out its grief, exhales through surfaces, the sideboard, the curtains, the stale air stalled there, the kiln fire and claws of the China bird. This is the hour when every ornament unloads its atoms of pretense, stone, brass, bronze, what they represent set aside in the dark. They become again a spacious morning in the Comorax, an iron gate, a sudden downpour, a well in the corner of a farmyard, a pool of rain into which an Irish world has fallen. Out there, the Americas stretch to the horizons. They burn in the cities, and darken over wheat. They go to the edge, to the rock, to the coast, to where the moon abrades a shabby path eastward. O oh, land of opportunity, you are not the suppers with meat, nor the curtains with lace, nor the unheard of fire in the grate on summer afternoons. You are this room, this dish of fruit, which has never seen its own earth, or had rain fall on it, all one night and the next, and has grown in consequence a fine crazed skin of porcelain. So I guess America is not always the land of opportunity for the newly arrived Irish or migrants. For some, it's a land of memories of having left Ireland. It'll be up to their, uh, their descendants to consider America to be the land of opportunity. <laughs> That's what I got out of it. Anyway. All right. Love Thanks, that. Steve. Yeah. Okay, John, go ahead. Lines written for a 30th wedding anniversary. All right, thank you very much, Caitlin. And um, I'll just say that Caitlin is, uh, said I'm the bridge between the Evan Bolin readings and the fringe. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to read a poem and I, 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 as I was going through her poetry, I realized that this poem is one that I had, had inspired a poem of my own. So I will um, kick off the fringe, I guess, by uh, reading that one after I read this. Um, but I, I wanted to thank Tara. Uh, I think Linda has been, uh, Linda McCarriston sort of been a presence in the room all evening <laughs> for me. And um, I think she introduced a lot of us to um, Ivan Bolin uh, knew her and, and certainly promoted her poetry. And I think also, um, you know, she, Evan Bowen, so much of her poetry is about um, giving a voice to uh, 
uh, women who've been silenced in history or erased from history. And uh, so uh, it's just a nice thought to uh, bring Lin Linda back into the room tonight. So, um, so uh, this is lines for 30th wedding anniversary, also from uh, Against Love Poetry. Somewhere up in the eaves it began, high in the roof, in a sort of vault between the slates and gutter, a small leak. Through it, rain which came from the east, in from the lights and fog horns of the coast, water with a ghost of ocean salt in it, spilled down on the path below. Over and over and over years, stone began to alter, its grain searched out, worn in. Granite rounding down, giving way, taking into its own inertia that information water brought of ships, wings, fog, and phosphor in the harbor. It happened unto our lives, the rain, the stone, we hardly noticed. Now this is the day to think of it, to wonder, all those years, all those years together, the stars in a frozen arc overhead, the quick noise of a thaw in the air, the blue stare of the hills. Through it all, this constancy, what wears, what endures. This is the end of our formal program. If you have not um, participated in Fringe before, that is our sort of after party party <laughs> um, where we have people usually sign up in advance to read um, whatever they like for three minutes. Um, and if you didn't sign up, that's okay. We keep it open kind of as long as people are here and want to keep going. Um, but again, this concludes our formal program. So thank you to everyone who has been here. Thank you to Ray for a lovely mm -hmm. Uh, first half of the program. Wonderful, a Nubiak poet. I did not know her until I heard word that um, through um, Peggy Shoemaker's press, um, mm. the imprint with um, Red Hen Press, I think it's, is it Borealis? Well, that she had been published and all of this. And through, so through Peggy, I, um, and she will be our uh, local poet, our regional poet, um, and I don't know who she's choosing. Meanwhile, Peggy Shoemaker said that she would be um, our um, chosen poet some months down the road, months down the road, because we have uh, Ishmael following, um, if he um, remembers, we talked about it earlier, I got to check back with him, but I wanted you to see that. And now we can do our three minutes because I have to go get what, what I'm going to read. Wait, happy birthday, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll probably have cake during Fringe too, since uh, my husband did get me a lovely cake. So. All right. Oh, happy birthday. We're going to sing happy birthday. No, you don't need to sing happy birthday. Oh, at least we're about no. to Why not? Why not? We're all here. Yeah. My, my Zoom class. Happy my birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's actually my the second Zoom rendition of Happy Birthday I've had today. So <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> it's kind of incredible. It's my second pandemic birthday because you know we went into lockdown, Ugh. you know, right at this oh, time last year, yeah. and yeah, mm. so it, it feels a little surreal. But I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited to hear John and Mo and everyone else read too. So. I just want to thank you for your your reading. I mean, it was just just astonishing poetry. I loved it. I can't wait to get your book. And then to be able to, you know, pair that with Ivan Bolin's work. And, you know, I think I, I wrote in the chat to some, I, I, wrote, I wrote to somebody that I think it's such a testament to Ivan's work that 
I mean, each one of us really presented something stunning. I mean, I, I just thought every single reader was uh, just just gave an exceptional reading, and and I think that's the strength of her of her. It's the strength of how each of you read, but it's not easy to read someone else's work. Um, and I think it was easier because of the strength of the poems themselves. And I was just really thinking about that, like, and so many of those poems are, have been deeply anthologized. And, um, and if you want to, as I said, if you want to hear her read like quarantine, you can hear her read it like 25 different times that she's read it. And sometimes she tells the same stories over and over again from reading to reading but you know pre pandemic no one would have known that that she was giving the same kind of talk about her poems in at cornell and then like you know at stanford or at berkeley and um but youtube the posterity of youtube lets us know that you know she she had a very consistent message when she was talking about her poetry um, and, and she thought deeply about them. Um, but again, I could listen to her talk about her poetry and poetry in general. And there's also some really wonderful, um, programs where she is talking about the craft of poetry. I'm thinking in particular about, um, an interview she did with Grace Cavalieri, um, uh, that you can see on YouTube. So, you know, uh, if uh, if you are obviously those of us who read tonight, we are very drawn to her for various reasons. And the nice thing is that there's ways to connect with her in a pretty intimate way, and and still hear her, still hear her voice as well. Mm -hmm. But thank you, everyone. It was really moving, and I'm really glad I stayed up late. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray! Yes, and let thank me, you. Let me echo that. I'm so appreciative that so many people turned out. I, I knew Evan Bolin would be a popular choice, um, but I'm just, I'm just so thrilled that everyone picked such beautiful poems. And and I mentioned in the chat, like there's not a dud. Like you can't pick a bad Evan Bolin poem. They just <laughs> aren't published. Like you know how some collections there are poems that can't stand alone and that's just never the case with her work it's it's all so beautiful and um it's been such a treat to have sandy here with her personal knowledge yeah. of as ivan and um to have to have tara and and others here as, as well and people mentioning linda mccarriston i i wish i'd had the opportunity to learn from her as a as a poet student but uh, thank you all. I'm so, so grateful. You, you all right. Your birthday with us. Yes, we appreciate birthday. that. <laughs> so thank you for that. All right. Absolutely. Shall best we get this? Best birthday ever? <laughs> well, best pandemic <laughs> birthday for sure. <laughs> I mean, I said, I said, I, you know, I had a day of, of teaching and meetings and, you know, catching up on odious tasks, but I was like, I'm celebrating with poetry and pizza and Irish whiskey and also I guess Okay, wine. that makes me want to go so get a fill of my wine glass. Should we take another it's, minute? It's which, wonderful. Which, <laughs> do what you need to do. do that. I know I'm which whiskey? Which, which whiskey? I, I just bought some of the Jameson's that's bottled ah, yeah. in the IPA in the IPA bottle or the IPA barrels. Um yeah. that I'm I'm very excited to try this evening. So mm -hmm. I usually drink bourbon, but I was like, it's it's St. Patrick's Day. I have to talk to you about all the time I spent in Ireland. <laughs> I really have only spent time in Dublin. You know, I I lived in Spain for a year and a half and I've I've lived in, in Mexico and but uh, Ireland and, and, and England, I feel woefully unfamiliar with the countryside. Mm -hmm. I've spent a, a great deal of time in, in London and some time in Cambridge, but really not much 
I haven't been beyond the pale of racing. Well, so. One of uh, Poland's poems, uh, I was in the bar and show, the show was <laughs> referenced. <laughs> so, but I've also bicycled to the west coast of Ireland. I am here. Okay, I was going to say, we're waiting for Sandy. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, instead of sharing my screen, because I don't really need to do that, it's just a list of names, um, we are going to start with John, and then Mahogany is going to read after Anne, and then Cynthia will read. So, John, go ahead. Gotcha. Right. I, mean, I don't remember who read Quarantine, but um, <clears throat> this is a poem that's um, I did sort of a series of poems that um, in part had to do with, it was Irish in America in the mid 1800s, um, but part of it was getting here from there. Um, and this is one, and like I said, it was inspired by that one that I wrote, or it's a uh, model after you will see, but it's called A Drop in the Ocean. And it's set in, um, I'll just give you one term that's not familiar. Um, that poem, Quarantine, is talking about the you know, the, the famine, uh, years of famine, and um, so many people were leaving um, Ireland trying to, uh, and, and uh, many left on ships that sailed to America, and so many people died on those ships that they called them uh, coffin ships. So it's a term that might not be familiar. So this is called a drop in the ocean. Somewhere high up on your cheek, it began while freshing your face in the chipped basin, you cheated a glance in the cracked dark glass where possibility keeps its daily appointment with reality. It spilled an unnoticed leak in the ship you run with tight desperation. And when that salted wash water was tossed at the end of day, it joined a headstrong rivulet of rain, working its way round the rocks of your yard negotiating each cold stone as it distanced itself from your cottage door. In the drizzling dark, it followed a path you've worn for years, spilling past the gorse whose branches, glinting moist starlight, shelter thrushes with voices swallowed deep by dreams. Quickening down the ditch through the fields you'd work, it had no thought to turn back as it found its way through muddy runoff to clear currents of swelling tributaries swept toward the salt of harbors where coffin ships await. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Thank you. Sandy, our illustrious leader, you get to go next. Thank you so much. I picked a couple, couple two poems I, I rare, rarely read, but I first want to acknowledge um, John McKay from that class so long ago with Ann Caston. Just a class of four of us, maybe five, but it was extremely memorable and a lot of writing came out of it. It's from all the attention we had from the instructor. Uh, this first poem is just a series of sketches, literally that's part of the title, written while I was volunteering at the International Gallery of Contemporary Art, which just means you sit there and maybe a customer comes in. Um, and there was plenty of time, uh, daytime and maybe in winter. And so these were written then, and then it's followed by another one. These are wordplay kind of things. It's followed by another that's a bit like that too. Sketches from the International Gallery of Contemporary Art. I was in neutral when the wind seduced me. I read impatience into it. It was a close reading. Never doubt the fury of the dishes or the slack tide of the spring chicken. I looked for a nice personality. There was one in the evidence locker. It was unwarranted. Undertones of remorse replaced each quiet sin. Watch for the implications, he said. Walk out the consequences. 
the uncertainty of the stranger, the fidelity of a fine-toothed phrase, commingle in the outfield of your extravagance, your lean but muscular defense. Appeal to the Olsons of your rudimentary, rudimentary digestive system to the laughing rhinoceros of love's refrain. We loved him best when he was quintessential, when his face was an open forum, his arms a range of options. We loved him best when his legacy preceded him, lured by essential oils of opposing forces. And we loved him with mercy, with melodies of madness and the two-bit hand job of immortality. She raced the clock and placed a velvet cushion where whimsy once reigned. She cracked the pumpkin of restraint and relinquished custody of her scars. The coal train is a long train, short on time. There was no leg room in her memory. Wasn't enough that, wasn't it enough that broad band, the fall, we met beneath the metronome, you mated out my punishment. Now the only way to hurt you is to hurt myself. Even the gambler will hand you a 20. Adrift on the ship of intention, he was late to the communion of saints. Eyes half-masked, he lingered in the timeless zone. On the filigree of catastrophe, he will hang his hat. He refrained from actionable, actionable offenses. He knew no end. So now we move into, I'm going to change your view for me here. I want to see you. Brenda. Adamant. You are fleeting, my love. You are postponed. You are apportioned, partitioned, and approximate. Don't flee, my fleeting love. Don't fly. I prove for you. I plan an architecture of allowances, a blueprint of parity, a study of one. My thoughts are sequined holograms stitched by hand on tool. My numbers are primed and very pretty. My portals are peaked with cranberry illusions of perpetuity. My portions pine for you daily. I have no penchant for peaches from the orchards of neglect. No recompense to blight. Come close, my lovely love. Reach for me in your element. Swallow my pride. Taste my essential highs. Make me a splash hit. Train me, love. I spin within my penchant for failure my lackluster, lack of stature, loss of latitude, as I ring labored melodies out of cadence, never winning, the cause lost long ago. It's probably funny to someone. Nice ending. Thanks. Okay, Brenda, your turn. Okay, I was just waiting to see if Sandy was going to say something further. All right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention something that I think everyone here already knows. Um, but on April 1st, the newspaper is going to publish poems by, um, by poets and everyone is to send in a poem and it's supposed to relate to either current events or things that are going on in Alaska. And so they're going to see how many they have and then uh, and then I guess publish a page of them. I just wanted to mention that. And then um, I'm going to read a poem I sent in. And uh, in Spokane, they, the poet laureate of Spokane has a project called the Neighborhood Project. And if you ever lived in Spokane at any time, um, they would like you to send a poem in. And I believe they extended the deadline to March 14th. And so they put it on the web and it's found at spokanearts.org. And then um, it's the neighborhood project. And so this poem is in there and, and a whole number of people are in there that you may know, one of them is Jim. And, um, but this poem I wrote about is from the East Bragg area 
uh, about the old Sperry uh, flour mill. And now it's kind of a landmark and they've changed the area. They're calling it um, Sprague Union. But anyway, it's called the Donut Man. My daddy, he be a donut man. He works late at the flour mill and when he comes home, he carries a sack, a big sack full of donuts. They don't have icing on them. They're plain, but taste like cake and look like little wheels. My mama, she said, good, we have dessert tonight. And I laugh because we're having a party. My daddy has so many donuts, he gives them to all our friends and I eat all day and more are still sitting on the kitchen table. They're free because the mill gives them away, all the ones not eaten at the end of the day. When I grow up, I'll make my mama happy and give donuts to my friends. Every day a party with plenty for daddy because I'll be the donut man. And anyway, I'm doing some drawings to go with it because it just sort of turned itself into a children's book. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. And I want to say Eric is next. I'm scrolling. Yes, Eric and then Anne. Okay. Well, first I'm going to say, John, I, I love your COVID hair. I, I have the same hair. But because I have nothing on top, it's all behind. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, I have two poems. The first one I've, I've, I've never read before. It's a pretty personal one. I'm pretty usually pretty reticent to read personal sort of poems, but we'll, we'll start with start with that one. So, so the first one's called Gale. Just cremated dog willows, cancer bitten bones and drove to Gail's annual exam, my back spasming. My mind misplaced, post polio did not let her drive. I lay in agony on the lobby floor as doctors poked and prodded her. Later that day, they called her back the test looked wrong. White cell count way too high. She joked when I asked the new results. She hid it from me until sitting on the bed, she calmly said, leukemia, holy shit. I realized she hadn't wanted me worrying about her while, while driving in intense pain. Right. They cured my cousin of that cancer. It took him two weeks to decide there was no cure. Can you be in Seattle in the morning? They killed her blood cells. The pieces clogged her kidneys and almost killed her. I slept beside her for a month on pain pills before they let us fly home. She searched the web before the doctors would stay. Two years, I read hoping. No, she corrected me, only one. Each day I pumped care and saline into her port to keep her arteries clear for chemo at the oncology ward where everyone was dying too. She looked so good, the doctor would forget. And she kindly reminded him she was too old for a stem cell exchange. Then came the day when the doctor sat me down. If there's anything you need to do, do it. Turns out she had known to the day 
when she would die. Our pastor never asked of her cancer. She simply said, three months. Leaving her eulogy, he called her by some other woman's name. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. One more. <laughs> yeah, no, keep going. I just wanted, to, I mean, I don't know if you're watching the chat. Everybody was very appreciative of that last poem, so. Yes. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. I've never read that one before. This one I've read before. Dogfish Rock. There's a trail on the mountain. I hiked as a boy. Now, the house sits next to it. On the way up, our dogs leaped up and lapped rainwater from a bowl. Atop a boulder midst berries, blue and crow. We picked there often, and she asked that her ashes be spread below the rock. I put down dog Lupin two weeks after she passed. Both ashes lie there now, so I stop on the way up and with Dog Day Daisy, who drinks rainwater water from Dogdish Rock. Two, two things to add to that. Daisy's ashes are now there. And I read this poem uh, at uh, uh, Tucker Bay when Louise Erdrich was there. And after I read that poem, she came over and and bug me after that. <laughs> after that, that I'll, I'll probably I'll remember that for the rest of my life. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. All right, Anne, you're up. Okay. Um, the first one um, is called Heliotropism. Midsummer. 11 p.m. The sun still gives color to the sky, the leaves on the trees. Its golden fingers reach past the hem of the blackout curtains. Tendrils of laughter from children playing football follow easily in their wake. You stand precariously, one foot on the lid of your toy chest the tangled curls of your head tucked between the curtain and window. You strike me as a flower bending its petals to the last rays of sun. Um, and the second one I want to read is called Come Spring. What happens when the good news isn't good anymore. When the storms of hate precipitate snows of division and lies for so long they cause avalanches. Roaring walls of snow bury all in their path. Uprooting truth, filling ears and mouths with ice crystals, swallowing souls under depths of frigid lies, immobilizing the quick, leaving them to at least fear thine. Choking on the truth their frozen tongues cannot utter, ears filled with snow refuse to hear. You looked at me silent for 47 breaths, weighing words in your heart, feeling them in your mouth, swallowing the first responses, too easy to say, too full of the memory of the storm. You pluck at the tools on your bench, looking for the one with the right heft, your chest rising and falling, breaths audible as you line up words on the page in your mind. Then cling to one another anyway, Make the small good larger by celebrating it. Thank one another for what you do, 
for what you each do every day as though it is a precious gift, because it is. And finally, remember to be as brave as snowdrops, improbable little flowers with delicate necks that push through snowbanks left by fierce winter storms saying, it is time, it is spring, let us begin again. Thanks, Anne. Mm, mahogany, you're up. Is Mahogany still here? Yes, you are. But you gotta unmute, girl. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sweet. Right on. Thank you all. Um, thanks so much, Ray, for being born today. You know? Right? Like, it's epic, you know? That's what's up. <laughs> anyway, so uh, because you started out talking about Gwendolyn Brooks, I have one that I wrote like a few years ago. And I've never shared this one. Um, it's titled, Hey, Gwendolyn Brooks, We Too Cool. We Too Cool, We. New School, We. Bop, Same, We. Straight Game, We. Bad rap, we. Oh snap, we. Hips hop, we nonstop. And that followed the um, the the format of her uh, her poem, we cool. And uh, <laughs> so I have a poem here. It's inspired by some grimy mofos on the moon. And um, I just want to give credit where credit is due. A virus don't got my sister Nell with grimy mofos on the moon. She don't lost her taste and her smell and grimy mofos on the moon. I can't pay these high ass doctor bills for grimy mofos on the moon. 10 years from now, I'll be paying still while grimy mofos on the moon. The man just up my rent last night cause grimy mofos on the moon no hot water, no toilets, no lights for grimy mofos on the moon. I wonder why he's up in me. Cause grimy mofos on the moon. I was already paying 150 a week with grimy mofos on the moon. Streaming services taking my whole damn check. Anti-maskers making me a nervous wreck. The price of cable is going up. And if all that ish wasn't enough, a virus don't got my sister now with grimy mofos on the moon. She don't lost her taste and her smell, but grimy mofos on the moon. With all that money I made last year for grimy mofos on the moon, how come there's no money here? Hmm, grimy mofos on the moon. You know, I've just about had my fill of grimy mofos on the moon. I think, think I'll send these Netflix bills. Overnight delivery to grimy mofos on the moon <laughs> yeah and that's a that's uh it's inspired by uh well jill scott heron he wrote a piece in 1969 called whitey on the moon so last month which i think was february the, um there was some uh the bookmobile people had a virtual art fair going on so i submitted uh they it's like yo they was doing songs dedicated to the moon and then they came across, you know, Gil Scott Heron's ones. And it's like, well, who could do this poetry? Well, who could cover this? And so they thought about me and I went through the roof. Like, oh my gosh, like, you know, spoken word, it just does not get no more like historic and like, oh. So I was like, so happy to do that piece. Just it's got music and everything. Um, but I have one more that I want to share. And this is, this is because it's Ray's birthday, right? And she just don't understand really like how special it is this week is, right? This is a very special week for the entire multiverse because Wonder Woman was born <laughs> March 22nd, 1976. So I wrote this poem for all the, um, the Wonder Women out there and just to like, you know, springboard off of the Wonder Woman portraits already out there. This is titled, 
Happy Earth, uh, Happy Earth Two Day Wonder Woman. Oh, oh, Wonder Woman. I should say that Earth Two. Oh my God. I don't want to get into too much explanation of that because I can go on and on about Wonder Woman, right? But <laughs> real short, the there's multiverses, right? There's more than one universe in, in what a DC world. So the Wonder Woman we all know, love, and adore is never was never from Earth Prime, never from my Earth. Um, she's from Earth Two. So the one that was from my Earth, you know, the most she did in her life was being a secretary. So, but she never cared to be a superhero or anything. So I think it's always fascinating to know the Wonder Woman we really like. She's not even from this Earth at all. So uh, here we go. They deserve a poem of their own, not an ode or an inspirational song, for they are the champions of Themyscira after all, catches the world in one hand whenever it falls. While they are in flight mode, cruise control, landing to toss men 20 feet in the air on every episode. Great Hera, is there not enough proof must they compel you with their lasso of truth? She deserves her own recognition. Her birthday on Earth, too, is seldom mentioned, along with her twin sister, Black Wonder Woman. Super strength and psychic powers they have in common. Why? Just by tapping their chakra on the crown of their tiara. Or if the baddies think they got away without pain, bring them down by throwing it like a boomerang. They deserve their own salad and ice cream, a gift certificate to the so a gift certificate to have the invisible jet professionally clean. Spit polished magical bullet deflecting bracelets, even a surprise party from socially distant places. And oh, most definitely a vacation from the Justice League. A little appreciation is all these ladies need. Complete with poetry is what I say. A, a day-long celebration for their birthday, March 22nd, 1976, born in multiverse, a time to place Diana and Nubia Wonder Woman first. And this is Nubia, y'all. This is Nubia. She was gifted to me a couple years ago now, but she still got her birthday hat on because it's always like a birthday party going on here. So happy birthday, Ray, from Mahogany and Nubia or Nubia Mahogany when I'm not MC Mahogany Magnetic. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mahogany. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a couple more. Cynthia, I might throw myself in there at the end. We'll see. <laughs> it's a hard act to follow, but I will try. Mama's laughter. Oh, I was going to say this Mama's Laughter is coming out in Pensive, a global journal of spirituality and the arts, which was founded in 2020. So it's a new journal from Northeastern University. Pretty cool. Mama's Laughter kept away fireflies, pushed her head back, shook hard her slim shoulders, flooded over my soft childhood laughter. It made all seem light. She kept on interrupting my dreams through bright Alaska summer nights, magnetized men to her easy ways, gut tight laugh, rat a tat tat, howitzer laugh, like we all have in this family. Campfire beer toasting August hippies. No stay. Interwoven hours in Shangri La. Her gauzy Raja top blows in Indian breeze. My titties are way too small to offend anyone, she says as she bends and shows her smooth stomach, stretch marks showing on bronze between her hanging nipples on her fleshy bumps. The earth delights in feeling her bare feet, long copper hair, hookah pipe on jeansy knees, Michael, Cliff, Dave, Ted, sister, mama, me. Six people toke off around hookah pipe, toking, cooking corn, potato, fresh trout. Want some honey? Just say yes, be polite. People come and go with baggies or foil pouches. Free love, free wishes through the night. Utopian trailer park groupies sing. 
of Michael's guitar and vocals. Sweet Kumbaya and we poking sticks in fire ring. My Lord Kumbaya. Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, Mama's banjo, twanging its new perfect timber. Like great grandpa blew the mouth organ, we got music. Fire sparks, cracks blue amber until it's pitch dark for a few brief hours and we sleep. Mumbling Cat Stevens. Oh, very young, what will you leave us this time? Okay, thank you. Tamara. All right. First of all, thanks for having me. This is the first time I've been here. And uh, Sandra invited me. Um, this first poem I'm going to read for you is something that was published first in Cirque a couple of years ago. Yay, and uh, thank you. And oops, I'm losing my, I'm losing my, <laughs> I have like the tiniest like ear holes like in the world. <laughs> okay. And um, it's now, this poem is now in my brand new book that just came out during the pandemic called Intention Tremor. And so I'm going to read this one for you and then just a short one after. So thanks again for um, having me. I appreciate uh, being invited. And this has been a really, a really great reading. So um, only thing you would need maybe to know for this poem is uh, the title is the name Canab. And Canab is a place in Utah where they used to film all the spaghetti westerns. So, um, and so that you know, because that's relevant to the poem, I live in Kingston, Washington, which is a fairy town on the other side of the Puget Sound from Seattle. And uh, this book is a collection of um, prose and poetry uh, chronicling my life after I was diagnosed with MS. So there's the context for this. Canab. I want to go to Canab, dry and red, hot and lost, a place of high noon distress. There I could be a hermit. I could build a kiva, disguise it with sagebrush, sink into its cool shade stare down scorpions, anything to silence words and voices. At least you don't have cancer. At least it won't kill you. Instead, my days are links in an endless chain of rain, moss, and MRIs, blood draws, talk of the risks of immunomodulators, gorilla approaches to side effects. My speech, already compromised by a broken brain, fails new vocabulary lists. Paresthesia, gadolidium, lermits, neurological pruritus. Meanwhile, I can still pronounce gooey duck, kinnick kinnick, aurora borealis, squim. My old self at diagnosis was tossed like a broken mannequin into the Salal ridden ditch of lost identities, not by a careless doctor or a cruel nurse, but by those who I expected to know better than to lob trite comparisons. Chronic autoimmune disease without a cure or even an understanding of root cause is no better or worse than any cancer or other protracted death. It's the devil of uncertainty, which unites us all indiscriminate. At least you don't have cancer. At least it won't kill you. What do these words even mean? I know what drizzle means and high slack tide, old man's beard. I remain on the island, damp and green, cool and contained, a place of hard pan clay. I hear the voices in the fog find their clever words veiled in the constant and unlikely solace of tinnitus. The joints of failing alder trees pop against autumn's gusts, promising widow makers hidden in the 
furred and widespread arms of cedar. This is no canab, but I will make do. Oh, so you muted yourself. There, better? Yay, okay. So um, I lived in Chicago for 12 years and then we moved back here 22 years ago. Um, but I'm from the Northwest, so it was kind of a homecoming and we lived in Chicago. And so um, this is a little poem that I wrote not long after I moved back here. So it's, it's an older poem, but it's sort of a, a welcome to spring and also welcome home poem that I enjoy pulling out time and again. So it's called Accepting Yellow. Accepting Yellow. Life in Chicago inspired a recession of yellow. Too hot, too thick, cloying, cloying color, scalding the landscape. No shade held comfort clear spring hues hoarded by snow, dazzling lemons meaner than the sun, so naturally I planted blues. Now that I claim the sound, it has reclaimed for me the clean, buttery cheeks of primula in March. Easy golden faces nestled among cream, plum, and salmon, so God sent in this gloom that I'd forgotten after just one week of Kitsap County rain that I'd ever disavowed yellow at all. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Tamara. Thank you. All right, Sandy Yanon. Hello again, folks. And um, I just put in the chat, uh, I had the pleasure of going to Tamara's launch unbelievable launch party like not even a party like an extravaganza like nothing like like you know prizes and everything like like you're like the heroine for me of like a launch and um so i want to just encourage you all if you get a chance to go see the full length reading go to one of her readings and she will be reading with us in a new book showcase and Cultivating Voices Live Poetry in July. But don't wait that long. Don't wait that long. Go see her somewhere else too. Well, it's been a night of wonder women, hasn't it? Like everywhere we turned. Um, in a little more sobering turn to that kind of theme that I felt was lurking here as we're celebrating Women's History Month. Um, I want to take you back 18 years ago to um, uh, Rafa and uh, a woman who, a young woman who was an evergreen student who um, was part of the international solidarity movement uh, to help support the Palestinian people for not having their homes demolished. Um, as, as I, she was an evergreen student, um, which is where I teach. She was not my student, but of course her death um, there in Rafa really rocked, the, rocked our campus and did send ripples throughout um, the world. Um, and uh, I wrote this poem just this past year. I'd been wanting to write it for a long time but it, it, um, it, it took me 18 years to write it. So um, here it is, it's a Sistina called uh, Let No One Stand Alone um, for Rachel Corey, 1979 to 2003. And um, I happened, um, that is the anniversary of her death yesterday. And um, every year they have a, the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and um, Social Justice always has events on the, marking marking that day, but all through the year as well. Um, and I got just before I came to the reading tonight, I got a really, really uh, very, very moving email from her mother because um, I had sent this this poem to her. 
So this is um, Let No One Stand Alone for Rachel Corey. The day I reconnected with evil again, driving south on I-5 to escape my own mini series of headlines in Bellingham, the news from Rafa broke, horrific like all history emerging, that she had died clutching fistfuls of dirt that day when she stood her ground alone, bulldozer, an American college girl, a standoff, March 16th, 2003, and national public radio reporting that evil had prevailed in not so many spoken words. Outside of Everett, I clutched the stories, every word, and the steering wheel harder than a car owner should, my knuckles turning whiter than history recorded, each mile driven, bringing news of worse news as Western Washington blurred by. A Caterpillar D9R, now news, conflicting reports as the operator keeps standing by his story that he never saw her, like all of history buried, a corpse shouldering its dirty shot glasses of evil, like everything that history swallows and disowns to keep its truth underground, soiled, all those clutch plays for convenient blindness, the way a small girl might clutch a stolen chocolate bar in her not so naive fist. The news that Sunday afternoon so disorienting that I couldn't own it over all these years. And for days after, everyone I knew stood shell-shocked on the campus bricks, mourning that something so evil could befall upon an Olympia family community in spring. We became history unforgettable, togethered in those distorted budding days. And history would repeat weeks later when a friend, originally from Belfast, clutched his armchair's armrests like the side of a lifeboat to survive evil's swells. Just hours after speaking at her memorial, he tried to keep the 80s news from Belfast at bay so as not to confuse everything he stood for from everything crumbling beneath Rachel's own sure feet. But he couldn't distinguish his own grief over losing Bobby's sister, whom he loved, from this new history still fresh in his mind like butchered meat. He couldn't stand anything now resembling the girlish present. And clutching his mug handle, I witnessed a man unraveled by more than news while we drank strong Irish tea, his heart having been evil's good next door neighbor for far too long. He stood up alone, clutching his own singular history, weeping, wishing Rachel had made her story farther away from the news and from that man-made blade of evil. Thank you so much, everybody. And, um, you know, happy St. Patrick's Day on that note. Um, but um, thank you for letting me share this poem this week. Um, and uh, as we talked about with Ray, history, you know, here it is, always in front of us, always behind us. Be well. Thank you so much, Sandy. Well, we are getting close to three hours here so i think we better close it out um thanks everybody for coming